really wonderful to be back here uh, because I was uh, when I was doing my PhD um, at the other school down or up the Mass, Mass Ave Avenue, um, Mass Ave. I you know I would come here to take classes in precisely in this room, so it's it's really nice to be back here. Um, so I guess after this I would have to go out to the Harvard MIT crew would get a Harvard shirt and wear it. But um, so it's 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 really a great honor um, to be given this opportunity uh, today. Uh, what I'm going to be um, talking today uh, is 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 not going to be because it's not this is not a job talk. So I'm not going to talk about something that I know too well or have some empirical you know um, evidence or have some hypotheses that you know, I I have to prove. But I'm just going to talk. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, trends that I think would shape the futures of Thai cities. And I use the term futures because I don't actually know, you know what's going to happen. So I think it could be futures, many multiple, multiple possible futures uh, for uh, cities in Thailand. And, um, so, and, and towards the end of my talk, I would probably I would give some uh, thoughts about what I think would be Implications uh, for urban planning in, in, in Thailand. I would take about, I think, half an hour or two, 40 minutes. So I would give my talk by giving some predictions about what I think will happen 20 years from now. And one is, well, for a student of urban planning, you may, you know, some of you would think, oh, okay, this is like, you know, the existing trend. Urbanization will accelerate with aging population. The interesting part that I think is happening right now in Thailand is it's not just the usual urbanization um, trend that you see elsewhere. It's, you know, in any part of the world, you see this um, trend already that people are moving into cities, people no longer live in rural villages, they move to cities. And, and that really has happened in Thailand in the past 40, 50 years. Um, it came with industrialization and all that. So now more and more people in Thailand live in cities. Um, the latest statistics that we had, about 40%, 44% of the Thai population live in cities. My prediction though, and I, I'm actually putting my own academic career at risk here. I think by the year 2030, uh, two thirds of the Thai population will live in cities, which means the trend will shoot up. And I think it has a few um, drivers that are different from other parts of the world. And one is is aging population. So a lot of, in, in other places around the world, uh, urbanization happens with younger population. <coughs> you have a lot of people. Uh, who are living in rural areas, they move to cities, they want um, better economic opportunities, that's why they move to cities. Now it's still the same reason, but what's happening in Thailand though, is that we have aging population. Um, right now Thailand is, is only second to Singapore uh, in terms of aging society. Um, more than, I think right now more than 10% uh, I think it's about 12% uh, of Thai population are actually over 60 years old. And by the year 2030 and then 2050, 30% of the population will be over uh, 60 years old. So we have this sort of, I would say, unique trend of urbanization with aging population. Um, if, if you think of cities or countries in Africa or in uh, other parts of Asia they still have really young population. I talked to my friends uh, in the Philippines or even in India. The population is still young and urbanization has happened fast. For Thailand, we will have fast urbanization at the same time with aging population. It's related to something outside cities. And one key indicator is actually aging farmers. 
the latest statistics about um, the age, the average age of farmers in Thailand is 50. That's pretty old. It, mean, it also means that you know, these old farmers have to take care of the huge rice fields and orchards and all those places by themselves when their kids move away. At the same time, um, large-scale mechanized um, farming is happening throughout the country. And it's not done by rural villagers. These are done by co corporations, big multinational and, and also Thai agricultural firms. <coughs> so these are other factors that are, that are um, shaping the way people move. But at the same time, you have old people living with their kids. So we have the skip generation households, about 4% of the total households in Thailand are actually skip generation, which is quite big because if you think of it, the old people who are farmers take care of their grandchildren who are still very young, but their parents actually live in cities. It's, it's, quite, it's, not, um, it's not the usual kind of domestic migration that you see, um, I would say, elsewhere. Because the parents actually move permanently. It's not seasonal migration as we once thought it was. So we have this sort of reverse seasonal migration, meaning the parents actually live in cities, big cities like Bangkok um, and Chiang Mai in the north and some other big cities in the country. And they do go back to the villages the small cities, but only seasonally, and not just for holidays or for you know some vacation time. They do go back to harvest. I can share with you some random uh, note, a random story. Um, Thai people like massage, and I have my own masseuses, and they actually go back during the harvest time because they do still own the land back in the rural villages that they come from. They own the land, somebody's taking care of the, the farm, the rice fields, but they have to earn cash so that they can hire people to take care of the farm. So you see some sort of, I would call reverse seasonal migration. You know, think of, before we thought about uh, seasonal migration, you have people who live in rural villages, they're farmers, they would go into the cities to work in construction or you know, sometime off the harvest time, and they would, they would go back to, to rural villages. What's happening here is different. People live in cities, but they do go back for the harvest period. So we see something sort of interesting there. But there's some uncertainties that I would like to sort of put out there. Um, as I said earlier, I'm going to talk about things that I actually don't know, meaning I'm not sure, but maybe you can help me think through. And this could be provocative, actually. The futures of Bangkok and western side Thai cities may be determined by Myanmar. Why? We have a lot of uh, foreign migrants living in Thailand. And you would think, you know, the U.S., you have a lot of immigrants living here, elsewhere in the world. Thailand is both the receiver and center of migrants. We have about 2.7 million foreign residents, foreign people living in Thailand. And that, that's, that's a large number. That's about 4% of the total population of the country. And um, about 2 million of them are actually migrant workers. And they're from Myanmar, from Cambodia, and from Laos. But we also have some, uh, not so sure if you can call them um, diaspora people, but they do come to Thailand to enjoy the weather during the, 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 the winter. We have snowbirds coming from Europe, sometimes from Japan. But they're not long-term residents. <coughs> we do have long-term residents who are uh, accounted for in the national census, and 2.7 million of them live in Thailand. 
Now, the question is, what's going to happen in the next three, four, five years when the economies of Southeast Asia integrate, become integrated? We're having this ASEAN economic community in two years, and it will be freer movements of labor. What would happen to cities? The question is whether they will go back. And if you think of two million people living in a country of you know, 60, 7 million, if they stay permanently, they have more kids because um, you know, they're younger. They stay for another 10 years, 20 years, what would happen? But on the other hand, if they do all go back, if Myanmar, you know, which is opening up right now, um, becomes an, an, the, the next economic destination for foreign investment, everybody wants to go to Myanmar now. It means it could mean that all these foreign migrants move back to Myanmar. They could move back to Laos. They could move back to Cambodia. Two million of them, and a lot of them actually live in cities. Right now we have a lot of public services that are provided for migrants. They're, they're, they're not counted you know, officially, but they're using the public services. They're using um, you know, services and, and other things provided by the city. So what would happen if, on the one hand, they stay permanently and become ties? On the other hand, if they go back. These are the questions that I think will um, sort of affect the way we think about Thai cities in the next um, 10, 20 years. Now, this is another sort of prediction that I have. The futures of Thai cities in the north and the northeast will be determined by China. There are a lot of projects going on now that try to link China to Southeast Asia. Um, Thailand and China don't actually share borders, but it's pretty close, um, 200 kilometers from uh, southern China to, to northern Thailand. And there are a lot of projects going on now that will link um, the southern part of China to Southeast Asia through Laos and Myanmar and, and, and Thailand. There will be a lot of um, railways that will connect these countries. Same thing with roads. Um, the roads are actually pretty um, good, actually. They're, they're really, really nicely paved, um, very well maintained. You can easily travel now from northern Thailand to China in a few hours, actually. A lot of um, road projects are going on in the region. It would become like Europe, where you can easily travel, where you can easily drive. And, and, and these networks of new infrastructure will certainly change the futures of a lot of cities in the network. And um, there are already a lot of Chinese people coming down to Thailand, um, not just as just tourists, but also as snowbirds. You think of only you know, New England people go down to Florida as snowbirds. The Chinese actually travel down as well to South Southeast Asia. That's where the warm, warmer climate is, and um, they would travel down. And actually, I just went up to a, a, a small town uh, in northern Thailand, and it just had um, about 5,000 Chinese tourists visiting in two days. And the problem is that there were no toilets. And it's a simple little thing, but it's a big change that could affect small towns. So a lot of cities in northern Thailand will be affected by, by these Chinese investment. And this is, by the way, um, it's a casino um, in, in Laos, which, but, but just across the Mekong River uh, from, from Thailand. And there are already some projects that would build new towns for Chinese um, retirees. Because China is also facing, eventually facing, the aging population issues as well. So they need, really want to find places for those people to live. So they already actually, over there, uh, they all, I think it was a 90-year um, uh, land concession deal that they had with the uh, Laotian government. 
So you see a lot of um, Chinese influence coming down to Southeast Asia, and they won't live in rural areas, they will live in cities. Another thing that could affect the futures of Thai cities would be what I call the new rubber belt. Southeast Asia is pretty well known for um, rubber plantations. Uh, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia are the, um, the main exporters of rubber uh, to, to the world market. But it used to be in the southern part of, of the country, actually, uh, because of the humidity. You can grow only certain types of rubber um, trees. But with new technologies, new breeding technologies, now you can actually grow rubber trees in the north, where humidity is lower and the temperature is cooler. And, and this, is, this is actually quite scary, but at the same time, it's, it's, a, it's a trend that could affect um, domestic migration. Because it, economic opportunities were, or are in cities, but what's happening right now, it's a micro-trend, they call, uh, or some early indicator of U-turn domestic migration, where some people who still own land to live in cities, have some cash, would go back to their villages and have rubber plantations. And that's happening throughout um, the northern part and northern, northeastern part of Thailand. You see a lot more people trying to move back because now they have rubber plantations. You, know, you need just six, seven years, wait until the trees grow um, big enough, you can get the sap, and you can sell. But then, it goes back to what I said earlier that Thai cities could be, the futures of Thai cities could be determined by China because a lot of people who were thinking of moving back may not have the opportunities to sell rubber anymore to China because China is now experimenting with its own, its own breeds of rubber plants. It's growing a lot of rubber plants uh, throughout the southern part of China, and they could possibly have something, you know, by the year um, 2015, I think, that they would no longer need a lot of import of rubber from Southeast Asia. So all these people who are waiting to go back may still have to live in cities. The second prediction, and this is simple, um, it happens almost everywhere in the world. So for you know, experts in urban planning, they're like, yeah, you know, you know this. Um, it's a simple bet, I guess, that in the next 20 years, maybe 30, 40 years, Bangkok will still remain the primate city of Thailand. And then primate, in this case, is not about apes. Um, Bangkok, what we mean by a uh, private city, in, in, for those of you who are not in the, the field of planning or urban planning, uh, is basically um, the disproportionate size of the largest city in the country versus the, the, the other smaller cities in the country. Um, if you look at this table, you can see that uh, the population of Bangkok has grown. Um, it's increased from 2.1 million. Um, about 50 years ago to 8.2, and this is just in uh, Bangkok administrative um, city. Um, we're not counting the whole Bangkok metro, and that could go up, the number could go up to about um, 12 million. But um, the percentage of national urban populations decreased, meaning there are other cities in Thailand we are becoming more urbanized. But the, the ratio between the, the population in Bangkok versus uh, the second largest city in, in Thailand remains pretty much the same. And, and I didn't go all the way uh, to um, 1960 or 70, but it's pretty, it's, it's pretty much like that, 40, 40 times. So Bangkok has so many more people living versus the rest of the country. As you can see, the, um, the uh, circles indicate the size of population. 
And so my prediction is a simple bet, I guess, that even 20 years from now, it will still be the same. But this is also because inequality in Thailand has become worse. And um, we, we just did some simple um, calculation. About 20 years, 30 years ago, um, if you look at this, the, this line here, the maximum ratio of, of gross provincial product between the richest province in Thailand, which is sometimes Bangkok, sometimes um, the province next door, versus the, the province that's the poorest, it was only about um, 13, 14 times. But in 2005, actually after that as well, it's almost 50 times. So Bangkok is so much richer than the rest of the country. And it's, I don't see that this is going to change. And it's kind of re reflected in the way the Gini coefficient which indicates um, income inequality in the country uh, has changed in the, in the past um, 50 years. It's kind of scary, well it's not kind of, it's really scary, that um, income inequality has increased that much. And Bangkok remains as the richest and biggest city. So I ran this simple sort of calculation as well, looking at how um, cities in each region um, fare uh, compared to the rest of the cities and, and provinces in the same uh, region. So it's not, it's interesting uh, to see that, excuse me, that um, the um, intra-regional inequality increases in most regions. So it's not just inequality between Bangkok and the rest of the country, but it's between the biggest cities in each region versus the rest of, of the region. So something is happening here that, uh, that would shape the futures of Thai cities. It's not just Bangkok versus the rest of the country anymore. It's also the regional centers versus the other cities in the same region. Another thing that would shape the futures of, uh, of Thai cities would be this huge, huge infrastructure investment. I think that they're debating it right now, I think, almost, um, about this bill that would invest about almost six, uh, 70 billion US dollars. Uh, people here, uh, somebody who could say that you wish that Obama would invest this much money in infrastructure in the US. But this is a lot of money. And, and, and the government will be spending this much on infrastructure that will link cities in the country. And it's not just linking cities in Thailand, but as you know, I showed you earlier, we'll be seeing, uh, linking cities in Thailand, with the rest of the region, and China. And this much money will be spent on high-speed train projects and other kinds of uh, logistical uh, networks in the region. Again, they would just increase the attractiveness of cities. <laughs> You're not spending this much money on rural development. You're not spending this on other smaller cities, but you are spending on cities that are already enjoying the agglomeration economies, all the benefits that cities are offering to people. So I would say that even in the next 20 years, cities will still be um, as attractive as now, not, if, not, uh, if not more. But, so what would be the uncertainties? What, what could be the things that change the scenarios here? We tried so many times uh, in the past 30 years, I would say 40 years, to decentralize, but in a different way. We used the concepts of uh, growth poles, um, you know, all the things that people try to do to stimulate economic uh, opportunities in regional centers. 
we're, we're not that successful because regional inequality is still pretty bad. But it's, it is this trend now called decentralization that could, could potentially change the futures of Thai cities. It's not just one or two cities in each region now who could potentially benefit from some investment, but decentralized system, meaning everybody could possibly do something. Now, in this case, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky business because on the one hand, you have a decentralized system of administration. But when it comes to urban planning, we know that you know, um, economic activities, social activities go beyond political boundaries. We used to be able to plan regionally. But now with decentralization, anybody can plan, literally. It's going to be like here, you know, Cambridge just across from Boston, Cambridge has its own plan. Cambridge doesn't have to talk to Boston. So this is a map of Bangkok and the rest of the, um, the surrounding um, administration units. Legally, all the little dots, they can plan. They can have their own comprehensive plans as they wish. So it could become, potentially, it could become like the US where you have small towns having their own comprehensive plans. I personally don't hope for that, but it could be. Another uncertainty is the flood. Why? Because a lot of people now have second homes outside Bangkok. And they already started talking about moving away from Bangkok because the flood, the floods actually, have been just way too much to bear. So what if in the next 20 years we have more mega floods than before? Would people start moving away from Bangkok to other parts of, of, of the country? This is another uncertainty that, you know, that we kind of have to think about, but we haven't really done much in terms of thinking there. Another prediction, again a safe bet, is that segregation will become worse in cities. We already have um, cities of sprawls and walls. We have that here in the US, we have that everywhere in the world, I guess, that people now want to live in the suburbs and they have to have walls. We believe in gates, not Bill Gates. We really believe in gates. <laughs> because this is the way people live now. The interesting thing is that I've done some survey of, uh, of gated communities in um, in northern part of Bangkok. About 90% of new housing projects are gated. So it means that people, like kids, will grow up in gated communities if or when, if they can afford to live in those places. So it means that we will grow up being gated. And 20 years from now, we will be gated people. Oops. So, I see that there is some, this is a serious trend of privatization of, of, of cities, of land, actually. And you, when we see more club goods now, it's not you know, the usual public goods or private goods, but they're club goods. They're club goods because they're enjoyed by people who can afford them. We live in gated communities. We live in condos. We live in places where other people cannot come in and enjoy the public goods. So, and this is a serious trend, and I think segregation will become even worse in the next 20 years. And it has a lot to do with the way the cities are transforming as well. Some of you probably have heard that um, Bangkok is called Venice of the East, although my Indonesian friend said that the, the Dutch actually called um, Jakarta uh, Venice of the East. I guess the British call Bangkok, you know, Venice of the East because it was different sort of 
kind of colonizing powers back then. But back then, um, it was it was uh, Bangkok or and surrounding towns were water-based cities. We live, we transport, we travel by water, and then came um, you know the, the modern. Uh, urban plans based on automobile about 50, 60 years ago. So the cities throughout Thailand have become automobile dominant. Now the interesting trend that's happening in, in the past uh, five years, or uh, ten years I think, is that it's shifting to this rail-based development. And it's going to be the trend of the city there. We now have about 86.5 kilometers of, um, of, of mass rail uh, transit systems, and um, the plan is that we will have about almost 500 kilometers. And that, that could be as, as extensive as New York, actually. Um, it's, pretty, it's pretty extensive. And I'm, I'm actually, I'm willing to bet, well, I bet that it's going to be, come like that although it may take a while, but it will become like that. Because now politicians don't want to build expressways anymore because they want to build mass rail transits. So I sometimes I talk to my friends and I say, that's fine, because at least they corrupt sustainably. <laughs> Instead of investing in expressways, which is not sustainable, at least they invest in mass rail transits, which should be a little bit more sustainable. Transit-oriented development is happening throughout the city. I mean, I'm talking about Bangkok here. It's, it's, it's real. Because it used to be that, you know, when you graduate from college, uh, you get a job, you work for about two years, three years, and you get a house in the suburbs, you get a car. That's sort of the mindset of young professionals back then, 10, 15 years ago. Now it's changing, actually. If you ask, I asked my students back at um, Toronto University what they would do if they got a job. They said, well, maybe I'll get a small condo unit somewhere close to the train station. It's changing. And it's real because now there are actually more condo units being built in the Bangkok region than single homes. And that's quite extraordinary if you think of it, that people no longer want to live in the suburbs the bigger houses, get that trade-off, you know, travel a little farther, all these residential location cities, <coughs> whatever you learn in the urban economics. They actually want to go back and live in the city now, because I guess on the one hand, the traffic is bad, on the other hand, life is probably better um, in the city. So you see the clear trend, and it's, it's, it's continuing, that uh, you have more condo units being built in the city. And it, it's growing, I don't have the latest one here, but there are definitely many more condo units being built in the city than single homes. So how would that be related to segregation? Because we once thought of you know uh, the rich and middle class move to the suburbs, they live in gated communities, that's a kind of segregation. But what's happening here uh, or in Bangkok is, is what I would call, well, it's not mass transit, but class transit, because they're actually quite expensive. You know, the, the, the poor and the lower than the class people cannot really afford to be on the BTS, what we call SkyTrain. It's actually much more expensive than, um, than, than the bus. So you have a lot of people who cannot really commute by trains. And you have condo units being built close to train stations. That's wonderful because you know that's transit-oriented development, right? You want to promote smart growth and all that. But what's happening is that, and, and we've done some uh, empirical uh, surveys, we've done some surveys, we found out that those who can afford to live in condos close to train stations are people who don't use the trains. <laughs> because they can afford the expensive condo units. Because it went, once you promote transit-oriented development, the land surrounding, you know, the neighborhood surrounding train stations will become more expensive. 
So the condos sold in the market would be too expensive for people to buy. So you end up having people, the middle class and the upper middle class, who would buy condo units next to train stations, and this you drive. And, and, and we, have, we have a paper uh, for this. So that's happening. And Bangkok is a, you know, a fun place, so we have a lot of tourists. So we have gentrification for tourism happening. We have a lot of wonderful five-star, four-star, zero-star hotels um, close to train stations. But they're really not for people who cannot afford. So you have a lot of, um, you know, Bangkok is, is, is still full of shop houses, but they're disappearing. They're disappearing because landowners would just tear down the shop houses to build condos, to build hotels. So these people who cannot afford to buy the condo units, they cannot afford to live close to train stations, they would have to move farther and farther away from the city. So you have eventually maybe rail-based suburbanization, but you would probably have to wait 20 years for that to happen. So the poor would still have to ride um, crappy buses, or they have to rely on informal public transportation, informal transportation, which are certainly not safe. So the uncertainty is there is, is of course, you know, whether rail-based suburbanization, like what happened in Japan or Tokyo, especially would happen, or whether you will have a series of real estate bubbles that will get rid of those condos and the government could turn them into affordable housing projects? We don't know. And my last prediction would be this, and this is also a safe bet, that the informal city will be there. And Bangkok will, and, and Thai cities will remain, you know, the mixture of formal and informal as long as the new cities remain. The inner city, as I said, you know, there will be some sort of like formalization of informal settlements because you already see a lot of evictions. Um, large landowners have already started increasing rents, so communities cannot afford to live there. They don't actually evict people anymore, but they do it through some sort of market mechanisms. So they increase rents, so people cannot afford to live there. They get rid of the wooden houses and they build condos. Or shopping malls. We have we don't have enough shopping malls yet. So what what would happen in Thailand is that you you have more informal settlements in urban fringes, and you now see a lot of them now. And and, and these informal you can call them slums, um, but they're they're really far from inner cities where they actually work. So we've done some, also some studies looking at how people commute. And I can give you a quick uh, um, sort of anecdotal story about this guy who's a motorcycle taxi driver close to my university. Um, and he used to live close to the, the university uh, in a sort of apartment, you know, cheap apartment. When the landowner decided to build a condo, he had to move away, move really far. But his, his job as a motorcycle taxi driver is in the city. It's right next to the university, which is in the middle of the city. And he would have to, he actually has to um, ride his motorbike, um, motorcycle about um, 40 kilometers, you know, <laughs> one way to the city to be a motorcycle taxi driver and then ride the same motorcycle back to his house far away. So, and, and that's sort of like anecdotal, but uh, we've done some studies and, and it is a serious trend that's happening. Informal transport will stay there um, because people will probably use more mass transit. The problem with mass transit is that um, you know, transport um, planners call them access and egress trips, meaning you, know, you access to train stations, and from the train station you go to work, you go to your office. Those are the, the hardest miles, especially when it's so hot. So 
in other places, you know, people ride bicycles, right? But in the case of Bangkok, people use motorcycles. And, you know, there's a great study um, by a Harvard, you know, student here about motorcycle taxis in, in, in Bangkok. And, and it's a big deal. And I think my prediction would be that the motorcycle taxis in Bangkok will still shape the futures of, of the city. And it will happen also in other cities as well, because you also see the very same problem that has happened in Bangkok in other big cities in the country. Oh, he said, yeah, I will still be here 20 years from now. Street vendors will remain. But what's happening, and I think it's quite alarming, is I would call it capitalization of public space. Meaning, <coughs> in the literature, you have this concept of um, you know, the informal workers being poor, they're independent, and you know, this is how they live, how they work. But what's happening in certain parts of, of, Thai, of Thai cities, Bangkok, Chiang Mai, and other big cities, is that you actually have capitalists hiring people to sell stuff on public space, in public space. You know, it happens in Science Square, which is next to my office, happens in the most expensive land plots in the country. And they're no longer just the poor who work independently. They're actually hired by some people. And I think this trend may continue unless you know, the government or somebody do something about it. And my prediction would that be that um, more foreign migrants will get into the informal economy even more. You don't see a lot of, uh, of Burmese um, street vendors yet. You know, a lot of them were uh, housemaids. A lot of them work in some factories. But eventually, as Thai people uh, move to maybe a little bit more formal um, sectors, you see more um, you see more migrants working um, in in that field, and the uncertainty part is, is about political representation. Um, the informal workers are not politically represented at all. There aren't a lot of um, support advocacy <coughs> for these people. So, in the future, this could make a lot of difference. So, in the last couple of slides, um, I would like to think about the implications for urban planning. How would this sort of make any difference for us urban planners? Um, and my colleagues in my department would yell at me if I say this, but I don't think urban development in Thailand has been shaped by urban planners at all. And that's kind of unfortunate to think of it. Um, and I think urban development in Thailand is being shaped by civil engineers. They're the road builders, you know, the infrastructure people who shape the cities, but not the urban planners. We are what in Thai called uh, Luk Mianoi, which is children of the mistress. Nobody cares about you. And it is a, 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 it's quite serious because planning as a profession is not really well regarded at all in, in Thai society. And um, it's also because I guess we're still stuck in this sort of comprehensive planning model that <clears throat> was given to us about 50 years ago. Um, this was sort of the first modern um, urban plan. Um, actually, the US, um, United States, uh, Operation Vision, you saw, uh, gave some money to the Thai government, and um, they had this uh, group from New York called Litchfield um, you know, and Associates to come in and make this plan. But there's a little note for MIT people if you're in this room. Is that, that Cambridge firm, Adams, Howard, and Greeley are actually MIT professors from urban planning, um, from the Department of um, studies and planning. So they're, they're the real people behind the urban plan in Thailand. And this is, was in the 60s, 
50s and 60s. So it was basically based on the American model of comprehensive planning. And look at what we have now. We're still doing the same thing 50 years afterwards. It's more detailed. We have some more sort of urban um, development controls. But the concept is still pretty much the same. It's still a sort of comprehensive, long-term, uh, master plan kind of thinking. They have, you know, we, of course, we follow fashion. So they've had some con new concepts in the plans, like uh, green, you know, um, sustainable, resilient, low carbon cities, they're all there. Gateways, you know, Bangkok and other cities would become the gateways of ASEAN um, and some other um, countries. Digital connectivity, you know, Google, every, everybody loves that. But we really haven't thought about how we would deal with gray population. You know, um, we haven't really talked much about universal design, you know, universal urban design, if you like. How we, we would build our cities for the aging population. We haven't really talked much about it. We haven't talked much about the gaps, the inequality that I showed you earlier. It's still increasing. It's not part of urban planning. We haven't talked about the gangs, you know, informal transportation, the street vendors, and all those people who control um, the space. It seems like urban planning doesn't care about these things. So what would be the prospect then for urban planning in Thailand? Well, I put the word advocacy there because I think um, the, the futures may not be shaped by planning, but could be shaped by advocacy. I mean, some people could argue that, okay, they're, you know, they're really related and all that. But um, it's sad to say this, but I, I, I don't think um, Thai, Thai society believes in planning. <coughs> I think we believe we're, we're more short-term people. So we don't really think of like you know what's going to happen in the next 20 years, and we don't think about uncertainties. You know, all the uncertainties that I showed you earlier, those were not really discussed in urban planning in Thailand. You know, we're still stuck to the same old model of comprehensive planning, of where to build things, where the roads should go, where the trains should go, and all those things that are, you know, of course in in the early 60s and 70s could be interesting, but right now, I don't think that should still be the case. But um, the hope, is, I think, is in advocacy. Um, is in the fact that the, the democratization is happening, really. I mean, we have a lot of political conflicts, and I'm not a political scientist, so I'm not going into the issue of yellow shirt, red shirt here. But it's really happening. You know, people are more aware of their rights. Um, democratization is really happening, and I think um, it helped in terms of how people think about public participation in planning processes, in building advocacy groups, in trying to work with the government, um, and, all the, and all those things that you see here in the U.S. can be a little bit extreme here, but we are uh, building that kind of trend uh, towards, uh, towards better um, advocacy and better futures of, uh, of, of, of planning time. Uh, there are a lot of innovative and uh, good efforts uh, in, in housing. Uh, Community-based development is happening everywhere now. Um, in rural areas and cities, everywhere you go, people use the term chung chuan, which is community. You know, community this, community that. It's really happening. And, and compared to um, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, the word community is just everywhere. So it probably indicates some, some good trend that could shape how cities um, would transform in the future. So the last slide here, I guess, is, is, it's, it's more about you know, me as a, uh, a teacher of urban planning in Thailand. Um, I guess we, as I said earlier, we're the mistress of the, not the mistress, the children of the mistress. So 
people don't really care about urban planners. I mean, they care about architects. But when it comes to urban planning, they're like, what do you do? I mean, do you just draw? What do you do, really? So, but the problem, the urban problems, we have more and more urban problems now. And yet, nobody, nobody really applied to my school anymore. I mean, I'm serious. I mean, it, it's the planning school of Thailand. And now, I think right now, only, only 10 people apply to my master's program. It used to be about 200. When I started working there a long time ago, it used to be 200 people applying to the master's program in planning. Now we have 10. What are we going to do? So I guess, you know, planning curriculum probably has to change. We have to go beyond what we did before in terms of, you know, training people to do all this master planning, thinking of strategic planning and all that. The skill sets would have to be different. Unfortunately, we're not teaching our students yet, you know, about this, you know, all, all the things that you teach here at the Kennedy School and at MIT, you know, negotiation, um, mediation, and those kinds of things that would probably be needed. But planning schools in Thailand, I would say, we're not really catching up with that yet. So we need to change that. And um, the last point about um, belief in planning, I think, is, is probably key. Because um, that's, that's sort of deep down. I asked myself whether I believe in planning as a teacher of planning. And admittedly, sometimes I would say I don't believe in planning time. It's kind of a chicken egg thing. You know, do you plan first so that people will follow the plan? Or you wait until people believe in plans and then you plan accordingly? It's kind of strange, uh, a strange question to ask um, when you teach planning. But that's why I said, I'm not sure if I believe in planning in time, but maybe advocacy is a way to go. So I will end my talk here. Um, I know I leave you with a lot of questions, but I guess because this is not a job talk, so I don't have to end it with a, you know, a, a, a hypothesis testing argument. But that's pretty much it. Thank you.